I do think of it as about the just the natural life force where you know something rots into the ground and that becomes you know it looks like death smells like death but then it also is a kind of uh, compost for new life you know, I had a kind of epiphany where I started looking down at the ground and it was sort of this incredible shift from landscape to still life and just looking at the apples fallen beneath the tree and that was when I started my project Fallen. They are Memento Mori. I see them as very much part of the Dutch kind of 17th century vanitas tradition. I see them as very much about the life cycle to the extent that like a Dutch still life might have, you know, the skull and the candle that's just, you know, been put out with the smoke. That may be more of just a reminder of the ephemerality of life, the sense of the brevity of life. The transition to color happened around the same time that I started looking down at the ground back at home. So I was like, hmm, I'm gonna try some color film for these. And that, is, that was really the, I would say that would be the official beginning of Fallen. Moving into Woven, I was really compelled to work at an even more immersive, more panoramic scale really inspired by medieval tapestry, Jackson Pollock, Bosch. But one of the things that I was thinking about, about both Bosch and Dante, is that everything's compartmentalized. In the Garden of Earthly Delights, there's hell, and there's this, you know, that big central panel, the kind of lusty, sinful earth, and then there's paradise. What my impulse has been was about kind of collapsing the three panels into one. My response to that painting, my very personal response, for me, I don't experience life in these three compartments. That, you know, that there isn't like the hell and the paradise and this other thing in three neat panels, that very crucially it's about the intermingling of those things. I think all the time about iconography. Certainly the snake skins, the snakes are all, you know, snakes are obviously one of the most potent symbols in the Garden of Eden, but I'm kind of into this sense of excess. So instead of one singular snake in the Garden of Eden, there's kind of this proliferation. So, you know, woven number one has, you know, some half a dozen snakes. Number 17, which is made up of antlers, is, is thinking about hunting tapestries and the sort of tradition of hunting, but there's this sense of extreme excess. You know, so it's, there's some 30 antlers. And really in some ways meditating on humans taking too much, you know, plunder. I think also moving to this scale, I did want to do something really bold and grandiose. And there was something even about turning 50 that had some relationship to that, that just, why not? <laughs> you know, just that I wanted to make something super intense to let kind of all of my love of kind of working obsessively and passionately completely out, you know, just to like, just completely let it out and not hold back at all. Um, and it's been <laughs> really great to work that way, like very, very ecstatic actually. One of the things that working in this wildly obsessive, constructed way allows me to do with bins and bins and bins of collected material is that I can put all kinds of things together that would not normally concur in nature. So in woven number one, I have, you know, I made that in June when cherries are in season and I have a few fairy roses that just came into bloom in my garden and other things like yellow foxglove and that are just just fresh. But then along with that, I have milkweed pods and that would not happen in June, that happens in the fall, kind of playing with the natural and the unnatural. That's a kind of timescape. I think it was the idea of 
a kind of Jackson Pollock immersive experience without an exit of the horizon line. There's not the same sense of context. So in some ways it was kind of like moving, you know, just moving down into the Earth's crust or onto the surface. I think that was really what appealed to me about it. The fairy tale part of these is really important to me. I mean, fairy tales are so dark. Like the original Grimm's fairy tales, just incredibly, incredibly dark, violent. <laughs> but also, also, they do have, you know, this magic. So I think, I think this gets at something which is very, very important, sort of probing something about the unknown in nature. On one hand, I'm using this medium, which is all about the visible world and describing the visible world as precisely as possible. And I always want to use the medium for that, for those qualities. But the, I think that sort of probing of the unknown, I do sometimes feel reluctant to talk about these things because they do seem sort of abstract and grandiose, but they are, they're very, very much on my mind. It was extremely important to me that when you move in close, things are described really lushly, really beautifully, so that you could experience sections of them in close like a still life, and then move back, and hopefully the idea is that they hold together as all over compositions. But I liked the idea that there would be a kind of equality or democracy between the things that have a greater iconographic weight, like a snake or a piece of fruit or an antler, as compared to like a little brown stick that's just maybe has a smaller symbolic role, but still has just kind of an exquisiteness just by, by something in the beauty of its nature that I want to describe as exquisitely as I can using the photographic medium.